I said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Right, and for those of you at the very back, I stayed in one of Lubbock's best hotels last night, and it did have shampoo and soap. I don't stink. You can move down. We have plenty of seats down here. The further you're away, the less attractive I look. Isn't that right, sir, down the front here? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm a slightly concerned that they've put this microphone stand here, because obviously if I stand behind it, you're going to lose me. Welcome. Is everybody in for a good day today? Yeah? Today is a day to pause. A day for us all to take time and think about the kingdom, how it pours into everything we do. We've got some amazing speakers for you today. People from all around the world. We've got people from Zambia, South Africa, Tennessee, and myself from Abilene, Texas. You laugh, but it's true. And do you know what? I laughed as well. And originally, obviously, I'm from London, England. But I now reside in Abilene, Texas. And do you know what the first question people ask me when I tell them I come from Abilene, Texas is? Anybody? Why? And I've got to tell you, when I wake up most mornings, it's the first question I ask myself. Why do I live in Abilene, Texas? Of all the places, I lived in Manhattan for nine years, right on 42nd and 10th Avenue. I could have settled my family there in 2018, but my daughter was afraid to go to university in New York. She was scared. She didn't want to move from England. Uh, we, I spent two weeks every month in New York working, traveling from the UK. And my wife and I decided it was no good. We needed to be together. I own a theatrical production company and we tour all of America. I've been to 47 states. I have been to places that you wouldn't even know exist in your country. I have been scared senseless. I have seen wonder. I have spoken to the most amazing people and had the most amazing experiences. And one of those weeks happened to be in 2015. My show stopped in Abilene at the Paramount Theatre and we had a week's rest. We never have any rest. I'm in Abilene, Texas. I got to golf every day. I found five good restaurants for the nights that I was there. And I found a community. A community of people led by God. A community of people that weren't afraid to talk about it. A community of people where you could talk about what I call Netflix experiences. Because I was talking to people that told me they were having direct conversations with God. Now where I grow up, where I grew up, that was stuff you saw on TV. That was stuff that wasn't real. That was stuff, as we would say back home, was only in movies. Yet these people, I could be stood at the Walmart checkout and the meanest, ugliest cowboy you've ever seen in your life, holstering a gun on his hip, would say to me, y'all have a blessed day, son. I thought the dude was going to shoot me. And he's telling me to have a blessed day. And I rang my wife and I said, She's Scottish, by the way, my wife. <laughs> Thank you. It's true what they say about Scots, by the way. I said to her, I have found where we are going to live. I, she said, oh, brilliant. Where's that, Matt? I said, we're going to live in Texas. Brrr. Literally didn't speak to me for two days. And when I called her back, I said, you're right now? She said, yeah, but Matt, Texas is full of people that drive big trucks and carry guns. I was like, yeah, they do that. But there's, it's not desert. We think in England, Texas is cowboys, horses and desert. I said, there's actually grass everywhere you go. There's trees. I've not seen a desert in Texas. I've seen a bit of tumbleweed. And that was really cool. I actually stopped the car on I-20 to take pictures of tumbleweeds to send back to the UK. We're weird, okay? Just, we're weird. And I said, I've found a place we're going to stay. And she's like, yeah, I'm not convinced. I said, it's all right. I've booked you tickets for you and the kids. You're going to come over. My daughter was 17. I got her into ACU at 17 to study musical theatre. And I put my son, I ripped him out of high school in the UK at 14 years old. He was the most popular kid in school. And I've taken him out there. And he hated every minute of my life for that as well. At school in the UK, he got to go at quarter past nine in the morning and finish at 2.15 with no homework. I've taken him to Abilene Christian High School, where he has to be in class for quarter to eight in the morning. He doesn't finish till six o'clock. He's got two hours of sport. I have to make him play American football. Don't get me started on that. How you can even call it football when you hardly touch it with your feet. 
and you wear pads. And to top it all off, you take tea breaks every two minutes. Like, time out, yep, cup of tea, crumpet, let's think about it. All right, you're good, right, let's start again. And I had to make it, and it was six-man football as well. So it's like rugby, but with protective clothing. And we moved there. And everybody says to me, Matt, why? And I tell you, I was in the West End, which is England's equivalent of Broadway, okay? From 11 years old. And the first big show I got to be in was called The Buddy Holly Story. So this city that we're in right now, and I, I, uh, when I talk and I get emotional, I might cry. Don't judge me for that. I'm a man at 48 years and I'm happily, I'll cry in front of all of you. Okay, just don't judge me for that, all right? It's my emotion. So me coming to Lubbock, by the way, for this event is like, I've come to the mecca of entertainment. 15-year-old Matt was in London, England, in the Buddy Holly story of the holy place that we call Lubbock, Texas, because that's where Buddy Holly was born. Clovis, New Mexico, that's like going to heaven for me, because that's where he recorded some of his great songs with Tom and Vi Petty. 15-year-old Matt had to stand on stage and record in a supposedly Lubbock accent, a voiceover. I'm going to give you two seconds of it. I'm 48 years old, 33 years ago. I'm High Pockets Duncan, and you've been listening to the music of my friend and yours, the late, great Buddy Holly. You can clap at that point, by the way, because I think that's pretty amazing for an English guy. <laughs> I can't believe I'm here today doing this. I'm honoured. Lubbock, Texas, to me, was a place that I could only ever dream about getting to. And I get to stand here today with some amazing speakers, some amazing people in this audience, and we're going to pour that into your hearts and our hearts and be in God's kingdom. And are you ready for that ride today? Yeah? Because today we're going to bring you the hope. So move forward. Don't sit at the back. Come down the front and shine in the light. Listen to everything you're going to say. There's lots going on. Um, should anything happen today, like the Holy Spirit get hold of us totally and there be a fire, your exits are at the back there. They're marked clearly with the exit signs, all right? Should there be an emergency, oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. Sorry, that's my other part-time job. Sky West is the best, I'm telling you. So today, there's going to be breaks, there's going to be sessions for us to break out and, and look at some questions and think together. Uh, there's a prayer room across the way there, should at any point you feel inspired that you need to go across there. Just open your hearts and your minds today and the rest will follow, I promise you, okay? So is everybody ready? Yes? My name's Matt. I'll be around. You can come and talk to me. It's not true what they say about the British, okay? Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Keith Toogood. 165 years ago, literally today, the markets closed their doors. The great panic had started in America. Murder increased, crime increased, women began to sell their bodies out on the streets. And it was all because of a financial collapse that happened in 1857. But see, in order to understand 1857, we actually have to understand what happened prior to 1857. You see, in 1843, there was this man, and his name was William Miller. William Miller was a Baptist preacher, and he began to predict the second coming of Christ. He said, based on the calculations that I have, in 1843, sometime between 1843 and 1844, the second coming of Christ is going to happen. And man, the news started spreading like crazy. The newspapers picked it up. Everybody was in eager anticipation for some date between 1843 and 1844 for, second, for the second coming of Christ. That day obviously came and it passed, obviously. First of all, if any man comes along and says, I know when Christ is coming back, just know that is a false prophet. <laughs> there, there is no man, Scripture says, that knows when Christ is returning. Not even Jesus himself knows 
That's what scripture says. So when any one man predicts that Jesus is coming back on a certain day, run in the other direction because they are a false prophet. So this man, as he spread this word, he amassed 500,000 followers. 500,000 followers in 1843. Uh, I had a friend of mine tell me the other day, he was like, man, that dude was like Facebook verified. He had like the blue check mark, you know? And uh, so he, he, he comes back, and he says, man, I miscalculated. I miscalculated. I think it's actually in 1840, uh, 1845, right? And so they like, all these dates pass. And then what ends up happening because of the false prophet is people begin to turn, these 500,000 followers begin to turn away from the Lord. And they say, well, then God must not be real. God must not be real. And so they turn from it. And then three years later, in 1848, the expansion of the West happened and the California gold rush ensued. From 1848 to 1855, the California gold rush is on. The telegraph became the main source of of spreading news in 1844. And so, man, the rush is on, right? And now money becomes the god of America. Money becomes the god of America. And so in 1857, there's a ship that's leaving from California with a load of gold and it goes around, and I don't know how it gets there. I'm not, I'm not uh, like a seaman or whatever they, those guys are called, a, 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 a captain of a ship. We'll go with that. Uh, so anyway, they, they head on their way, and a hurricane destroys this ship, sinking it. And then all of a sudden, the banking system begins to collapse. And on October 14th, 1857, the whole thing goes down. America collapses and the great panic, some of these rumblings that were happening in August and all that, the great panic happens. But on September the 23rd, there was a man named Jeremiah Lamphere who felt led months before to start a prayer meeting. And for months and months, this man passed out flyers, 20,000 flyers, 20,000 flyers. You got to think in 1857, that's a crazy amount of flyers because that's like printing It's not like what we got today, right? I mean, that dude is like pressing and going. And so he passes out 20,000 flyers. He didn't have Taco Villa uh, to help him pass them out, right? Like we had Taco Villa, at least on our side, like passing out flyers through the drive-thru and all kinds of stuff. We have partners in this. This man is out there hustling to get the news out that he's going to have a prayer meeting. September 23rd rolls around, 1857, 12 to 1, come and go. Just come and pray with me. 12 o'clock rolls around. 20,000 flyers, and nobody shows up. Nobody shows up because their God was money. So 12 o'clock, he hits his knees, he begins to pray. 12.30 rolls around, six guys show up, and they pray for the rest of the afternoon, or for the rest of the lunch hour. The next week, they agree to meet again. Ten more guys show up. Now he's got like 16 guys that are there. The next week, another group of guys show up, and they got like 20 guys when the whole thing collapses. Well, fast forward to December, and 10,000 are showing up every day seeking the Lord in prayer. These men begin to hit their knees, and they begin to churn, and they, they begin to yearn for the Lord, right? And so what begins to happen is is this thing starts to spread like wildfire all throughout the country. They said at the peak of this thing that 20 to 50,000 or uh, 20,000 people a week were getting baptized. 50,000 a week were were coming to Christ. Massive revival. It's called the Businessman's Revival of 1857. And I guarantee unless you've been to Boom that you probably have never heard of it. Raise your hand if you if outside of Boom if you've been to this, if you've ever heard of the Businessman's Revival of 1857. Uh, we, got, we got one. Yeah, that's about how it's gone for the last three years. Uh, Steve is the one. You'll hear from Steve in a little bit. Steve is the one who brought it to my attention. Never heard of such a thing. Dude, they said that in England they disbanded police forces because there was no more crime. They said over a million people come to Christ in a year. But here's some, here's some more incredible things. Uh, hey, would you bring me that book? Uh, here's some more incredible things that happened as this thing went down. Have you ever, if you're a theologian or studying in theologians, 
Uh, if you've ever heard of a guy named D.L. Moody, anybody ever heard of D.L. Moody? Yeah. Product of the Businessman's Revival of 1857. He was literally a uh, shoe salesman, a shoe salesman. And he becomes one of the greatest theologians and revivalists, revivalists of our time. Never got ordained, remained a layman. He now has a, a school called the, the Moody Institute that's named after him. You know that little song that we sing that every kid knows? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Product of the Businessman's Revival of 1857. And nobody knows about it. Nobody. Why does nobody know about this thing? Because the devil is terrified of the businessman. The devil is terrified of you. So as the Lord began to give me, boom, three years ago, boom stands for business operating on mission. He woke me to something and I've been on a mission ever since then to wake up a generation to understand their call in the kingdom. But I got to back up to 2018 because I was taking a, uh, like a personal coaching class. There was a guy, his name, um, I just went blank on his name, uh, Jeffrey Taylor, sorry. Jeffrey Taylor, uh, who was a former pastor here in town, uh, had decided to start his own uh, kind of personal coaching class and all that kind of stuff. And he asked me, hey, could I coach you? I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. So one day as we're talking, he goes, hey, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And I said, man, I think we have our cliche answers, you know? Um, but I said, man, I love analogies. I'm going to take it to me as a home builder. I said, whenever I sit down to look at a set of plans, I look at everything from the foundation and where the strength is, what the house looks like, what's the function of the house, like what's the purpose of the house, how are they going to use it? Where are all the wires dropped in and how are we going to wire this thing up? And in every single detail, I look at it and I create it in my image. I said, isn't God the same way? Doesn't he sit down with each one of our lives and he, and he lays out a blueprint and he writes out a plan and he says, hey, this is how I'm going to wire him. And this is what he's going to be all about. And I'm going to wire him for business. Well, if you go back and you look at, if you know anything about my past, I went to a, a small Christian school uh, in Dallas, uh, Church of Christ school. I was raised Catholic. My mom was Methodist. Uh, I now go to a non-denominational church. I, I got involved at Texas Tech and, and started going to the Baptist church, so I always jokingly say I'm like the mutt of Christianity. Uh, I've got all kinds of things inside of me. Um, but what it is, it laid out this really cool path. Well, I had a lot of friends coming out of high school that said, man, I'm being called into the ministry. I heard God's voice. I'm going to go be a pastor. And I thought, man, that's great. And at the same moment, the devil, knowingly or unknowingly, to me, cloaked me. He cloaked me. And I thought, well, I haven't heard that call. So I guess I'm going to go to Texas Tech. I'm going to pursue football. I hope I, one day I make it to the NFL. And if not, I guess I'll just come listen to you on Sunday. That's what we've relegated church to, y'all. That's what we've done with this whole thing, is we've made this about Sunday morning, and that's it. And then one day, we actually have a lot of pillars inside of, we have three pillars inside of Boom. We have a lot of passion about the business person and the businessman. But one day, Steve and I uh, were sitting down and, and Steve and I love, at the end of the day, to chop up anything Bible, man. Uh, we'll just get going, and the Holy Spirit takes over, and we just, we just go deep. And uh, one day I said, man, you know what? I said, Jesus didn't need anybody. Like, he's the son of God. Obviously, it, he did it how he did it. I said, but man, that dude could have come down, snapped his fingers, and just made anything he wanted to have happen, happen. He could have just chose one. He could have just chose Peter. He could have just chose his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. I said, but he didn't. He chose 12 dudes, and at that moment, it hit. You see, the very first dudes that Jesus handpicked were not some religious scholars. The very first dudes that Jesus handpicked were not some religious scholars. They had separated themselves. And he was new wine, and he needed new wineskins. 
So the very first dudes that Jesus handpicked were some business guys. And if I believe that God wired me for business, <laughs> it went off. I'm chosen. You're chosen. We have done this whole thing, no offense, all wrong. We are the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Now check this out. He raises these three dudes up, or these 12 guys up, right, for three years. And then they go, and he says, wait on the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything until you receive Holy Spirit. And then he goes, they receive Holy Spirit, and then there's this guy named Saul, the formerly educated, the one who had all the experience, all the biblical knowledge, all the scrolls. He read all these things, right? He had gone to like the highest school that you could go to to be trained to become a Pharisee. And Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and knocks him on his back, blinds him. He says, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was on the road to go kill Christians. But what I find to be so beautiful is that Jesus then takes, and he takes these 12 guys over here, and he takes this, this pastor, and he puts those guys together, and out they go, and they revolutionize the world, and because of that, you and I are, are adopted into his kingdom. Amen. And so he gave me this picture of what would happen if church and business understood each of their unique callings and came together once again. Amen. This whole thing, man, we have such a tremendous opportunity to go out to advance the kingdom. But if we're dependent on the church to do it on Sunday, we've lost it. We've lost it. You're called. You're called. You're called. Now let me tell you this. If you're in business, I don't care whether you're, a, whether you're a, a clerk, whatever you may do, whatever you do, this is not just to business owners. God never called you into business to be a slave to that business, ever. He called you into business so that you could advance his kingdom. That's the whole point of this whole deal, man. He called you into business so that you could advance his kingdom. I've actually gone to many pastors as I got boom and I came back and I was like, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to apologize to you because I've depended on you to advance the church. You were never intended to be all five gifts that Ephesians 4.11 talks about. The apostle, the evangelist, the prophet, the teacher, the pastor. But thank God that y'all have. Thank God that you have and you stepped into your calling. Now it's time for us to come along and help usher and shoulder that load. Would you let us do that? It's the body coming together. I'm going to tell you over the last two years, I became a slave to my business. <laughs> over the last two years, it has been hard. It's been difficult. It's been challenging. If you're in the home building business, I, there's a couple guys in the construction business in here. It's been stupid. Stupid. You can't find... Yesterday, just yesterday, I'm like, hey, where's the keypad for the garage door opener? I asked, I asked uh, Scott, my cousin. I was like, hey, where's the keypad for the garage door opener? He goes, <laughs> they don't have any, man. And I just literally threw up my hands and I was like, of course they don't have any. Light switches, HVAC systems. I mean, you name it, we can't find anything. And every single guy I see in my industry right now is literally exhausted. They're exhausted. And I talked to my father-in-law who's in the restaurant business. He can't find cups. He can't find this. He can't find wrappers. He can't find, I mean, you start going in, it's every industry. We're tired. Are you tired? It's been a long two years. It's been a long two years. And we've been trying to solve it all on our own. Humans are great at that, actually. We're pretty good at solving problems because we're wired by God. And so as I found myself a slave to my business, the Lord has literally brought us people from like all over the world. 
I'm not kidding, like I've not sought any of this out. Like if you would have known me as a kid, I was the shyest kid you would ever meet. Nobody believes that now. Uh, but I literally was the shyest kid you'd ever meet. Well, I was extremely anxious, I was nervous. All these things were going through my mind. And a guy calls me, I, I decided to do this deal called Kingdom at Work. Uh, they actually just had a workshop over the last three days. And if you have not done that, I highly encourage you to do Kingdom at Work. It's an incredible deal. So I'm part of this deal called Action Groups. And there's this guy named Michael Gowen uh, who leads our action group. And at first I actually was like, no, I'm not going to do this thing. I've already done Kingdom at Work. I'm good. And, uh, and then the Lord came in and said, you need to do this. And so I submitted to what the Lord told me to do. Joined that action group, got to know Michael, well, May of this year, he texts me and he goes, hey, what are you doing today? And I was like, man, actually, <laughs> amazingly, it's actually a peaceful day. And he goes, you need to meet this guy up here. And I was like, okay. So I get up there, he goes, can you be here at 4.30? I said, yeah. So I get up there and he says, hey, I want to tell you that this guy, he's from the Netherlands. And I was like, here we go again, because we've had South Africa, we've had Zambia. You're going to hear from an amazing man of God from Zambia today. We've had all kinds of people just show up to Lubbock, Texas. It's the wildest thing that I've ever seen. And he goes, this guy, he's from the Netherlands, and I'm going to tell you that he's prophetic. Well, coming from the Catholic and the Methodist and, you know, some of that background, like... <laughs> So talking about Holy Spirit and prophecy and all these kind of things, I'm like, man, what do you, how, okay, you know, but as I've grown, uh, I've gotten more comfortable and, and Holy Spirit has just softened my heart, my hard heart that I had towards him uh, has softened. And this guy comes up to me and he's got this really cool accent. I wish I could do accents well, uh, but I can't do his accent, but he comes up to me and he goes, hey, what do you do? I said, man, we're in the home building business. And then we have an Orange City Fitness in San Angelo and we just started this new business called Tico Outdoor, and we have a ministry called Boom. He didn't acknowledge any of that. He said, you an anxious person? <laughs> I go, no. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, uh, the Lord's telling me you need to pause. Yeah. And so... Six weeks prior to that, actually, for the previous six weeks, the Lord had actually been working on my mind on this whole thing, this whole idea of like kind of reorganizing, restructuring, all this kind of stuff, and showing me what it looked like to own a business. He was teaching me about his business. And I said, dude, I said, man, that's confirmation for me. I said, for the last six weeks, he goes, I'm not done. And I was like, who are you? Oh my gosh, who are you? And so he goes, the Lord's telling me you need to pause. You need to take a long trip with your family. And you need to allow the people that the Lord has brought on your team to do their job. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you're right. And he told me some other things. He said, you're going to deal with some things from your past that you didn't know you needed to deal with. And I was like, in my mind, I didn't say this out loud, but I was like, dude, I've dealt with that Miss Kick, man. Like, <laughs> that was a bad day. But like, I've dealt with that. And the Lord has actually turned that into a, in, into a, a great part of my testimony. You had to break me a people-pleasing. Better way to break you a people-pleasing than to miss in front of 80,000 people, make every headline across America. <laughs> All my dreams came true about making Sports Center, but it was not a dream. It was a nightmare. Uh, it was a bad day. I was like, man, I've dealt with that. I've dealt with my dad's passing. I've dealt with all of it. And then he said to me, I asked him after he, he said a few more things and I said, are, are, you, are you done? You know, <laughs> a little bit afraid of this man of God. And uh, he goes, yeah, I'm done. I said, man, I'm in, I'm in like 30 group texts. I get 300, 400 text messages a day. I can't keep up. He goes, you're a control freak. I go, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. And man, he began to just pour into my life in this fresh new way, right? And then he goes, your family have a history of heart problems? 
And I was like, no. And like, for real, no. Like, there's not going to be a back, a, a back end yes on this. He goes, I said, my dad's heart was phenomenal. And he just looked at me and he goes, huh. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, am I about to die of a heart attack, man? But what he didn't know is what was going on in my mind is that I literally had had so much pain starting to press down on my chest. Left arm starting to have a little pain that I was literally looking up going to look up, getting an EKG, right? Like, I needed help. And so I, I began to get into the, into the, the mindset of, of pausing. But we weren't there yet. We weren't there yet because I still had a major daily role inside of my company. And so for the next six weeks or so, I began to just, like, prepare myself for this pause. And... I remember he, he sent me a, a message on WhatsApp. His name is Sonder. Sonder sent me a message. He goes, hey, I just want you to know that the, that the Lord is kind and he's patient. He goes, one day is like a thousand years in his courts and a thousand years is like a day. And I was like, okay, it's all right. It's okay. I don't have to pause immediately, but I need to work through the process, right? And so I began to step into this pause. I paused for 40 days. I stopped my life. I literally got a brand new phone number, put my other phone to the side, and just rested in the Lord. This is contrary to what we talk about in our culture. And so as he began to lead me through his word, he began to show me different things. He took me to Ezekiel, and then he took me and he showed me Job and he showed me Jacob and he showed me all these people, man. And, and, and he showed me their story. But we're going to pick up in Ezekiel 8. And I want to share some things with you that he shared with me. And I hope what I share with you today changes your life because it changed mine. So Ezekiel chapter five, if you got your phone or your Bible, you can go there. Uh, I'm in the NIV. He said, then he said to me, son of man, look towards the north. So I looked and in the entrance, saw uh, in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. Never heard of such a thing. The idol of jealousy. I was like, well, that's interesting. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things that Israelites are doing here things that will drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here? Go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and I looked and I saw portrayed all over all the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, I think I said that right, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant, a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. Do y'all know what a censer is? A censer is something, you'll see it actually in the Catholic church. It's a, it's a deal that they'll like wave around, right? And it offers up this fragrant uh, offering uh, to the Lord. So they put their incense in there. And then they begin to like offer it as this like act of worship. So in the temple, actually, there is the altar of incense before you enter into the Holy of Holies. And the altar of incense is where you bring your prayers, right? So these guys are in there. There's 70 elders that are in there. Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, I, you know, he picks out one. And I'm like, why did he pick that one guy? Like, what, what about him? I think what he's about to reveal is that Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, was probably one of the most well-respected individuals of the entire eldership. This is one of the, the best of the best. He probably lived his life fully for the Lord, right? He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. We're going to pick up in verse 17 now. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter 
for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they're doing here? Is this some small deal? Is this insignificant? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Now, y'all, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, I was like, what is the branch to their nose? What does that mean? We'll come back to that in a second. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. So I began to look up and I asked the Holy Spirit, well, first, actually, I Googled branch to the nose, like looking up commentary, looking up, what does that mean? And, and there was all kinds of things that I found. Some of it said, we don't really know, but they could have, they could have, uh, you know, pierced their nose in a time of like suffering or whatever with like literally a branch and they would pierce it through their nose. I don't know, but that's some of the stuff that I found. All right, so now we're going to go. So then, so he leaves me here, right? And he shows me these idols that these people are worshiping and all these kind of things, Right. And as the Lord begins to take me through this 40-day journey, he begins to reveal to me that I have idols too. I got idols too. And I never saw them. Never saw them. So then he took me on this journey to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 6, it says, it's a picture of heaven. It's a picture of what happens in heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you that I do not fully understand Revelation. And I think any man that tells you that they know in and out Revelation, I, I don't, I mean, I've got one of the greatest, what I consider a Bible scholar that I know in Steve in my office. And he's like, man, I, pff, I, I like Revelation, but I cannot explain Revelation. There's so much allegory. There's so much like, we just can't understand it. But this part right here, this is a beautiful picture of heaven. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures, and who? The elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Man, powerful, powerful picture of what's going on in heaven. <laughs> Compare and contrast to what was happening in Ezekiel. These guys are down in there, and they are dressed up. They're, they're dressed to the hilt, right? They're these priests. That, you know, they have all their garb on. They've got their censer. And I asked Holy Spirit, I said, man, what is the branch of the nose? Would you teach me? And this is what he showed me. He said, look at them with the branch to their nose. In other words, mm, I'm so good. Look at me in all my religion. Look at my goodness. Look at how good I am. Receive my prayers. Receive my offerings. Though they shout in my ear. I do not hear them because they stand before idols. The very first command, or the very first, uh, the very first one is, it says is, thou shalt have no other God before me. Our God is a jealous God. He wants every bit of us. He wants every bit of you. And so then as I, as I dove into Revelation, he took me to Revelation chapter eight. And it says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God 
from the angel's hand. Go back to verse, uh, I think it's two. Verse three. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. It says he was given much incense. Who gave him the incense? So the Lord leads me to Romans chapter eight. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I believe that Holy Spirit comes on our behalf for things that we have no idea that we need to pray. He meets this angel, he hands him the incense, and he says, now go offer that with their prayers as well. As I went through this process, man, we hear about Holy Spirit being fire. We hear about, you know, flames of fire coming down on these people in Acts chapter two. We hear all these kind of things. And it got me wondering, why is Holy Spirit fire? Why is Holy Spirit fire? Somebody got it right here. Why is Holy Spirit fire? You see, now we are the dwelling place. We are the temple of the Lord. Holy Spirit sits inside of us. So whenever he said, tear open the walls, look inside, what's right here? Where is all sin born? In the heart. Where are all all idols born? In the heart. So as the Lord began to take me through this process and I began to think about incense and I studied incense and I, I began to think about all these things that the Lord was showing me. Incense is wood. It comes from the roots, it comes from the the branch, it comes from all these things. Look at them with the branch to their nose, thinking that they're offering up all these things to me, but in their religion, they're dead. They're dead. But then we get this picture of heaven. And in this picture of heaven, they fall before the lamb. They fall before the lamb. As the Lord began to wreck me of these idols and tear them down, He came in, man, and this is going to sound so stupid that that like we literally think these kind of things. We don't think these things, but we sure act like it. He came into me one day as I was like freaking out. I've, I've, I've told people that like I've never been on drugs before in my life, never seen them, never touched them, never nothing, right? But I've seen these people that go through drug withdrawals. Now, I've not been on a physical drug like you buy off the street, but my drug was business. And I would constantly just check my phone, check my phone, check my phone. And my wife had tried to call me on it for years. And I was like, babe, I, gotta, I just got to do this. I just got to do this. I just got to do this. And I was coming off of this like crazy high of business. And the Lord came in and with conviction, but not condemnation said, I'm God, and you're not. You don't control anything. You don't control anything. I ordain everything. I'm sovereign over everything. And he broke me of the idol of control. That was an idol called control that ruled my life. And then he showed me, and this one blew my mind. He showed me that I had another idol called money. And I would have told you, no way, no way. I hate money. I literally, with everything inside of me, hate it because it just causes arguments, disagreements, fights. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with clients and I'm like, you know what? Just forget it. We're good. I'll sacrifice it. I'll give it. I don't care. I don't like money. But it was my idol. And the Lord came in. And all along the way, I would have fear and I would have doubt and I'd have all this anxiety and he'd be like, Keith, I got you. Keith, I got you. Keep going, I got you. And I'd hear that. But then inevitably, I'd go to Steve and I'd be like, hey, would you pull the, 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 the bank account and, uh, and let's look at our financials? 
And I would go through the financials and I'd begin to see that we were being taken care of. Our needs were being met. And all of a sudden I would find my peace. And he showed me anywhere outside of me that you find peace is an idol. Anywhere outside of me that you find peace is an idol. Scripture tells us that Jesus is what? He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And as he tore these idols down in my life, he came in and he said, I'm inviting you back to the garden. <laughs> I'm inviting you back to the garden where everything was perfect, where you had complete fellowship with me. Yeah, you're gonna work. Adam and Eve, they work too. But they didn't worry about anything. They found their peace in me. I'm inviting you back to the garden. He wants the same thing for you. He wants the same thing for every single person that sits in this room. He wants the same thing for every single person, all 260,000 that are outside these walls right now. It's time to go back to the garden. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna take a journey. And man, there's gonna be people that are gonna come up here on this stage that are gonna rock your world. They're gonna rock your world. Like I'm literally like, I'm the peon of this whole group, y'all. I'm not serious. These people are so highly anointed. You're gonna hear from a girl named Centoya Brown that literally like this room, she, she packs out rooms three times the size of this. She is truly a gift of God. And you're gonna see an amazing testimony come out of this girl. And your world's gonna be rocked. And so here's the deal. There's 700 and some odd seats in this room. Right now, I want you to ask Holy Spirit. He placed this on me yesterday, and so I gotta be obedient. I want you to ask Holy Spirit right now, who needs to be here? Who needs to be here for the rest of today to hear the good news of the kingdom of God? It's good news. It's good news. And thank God for Jesus Christ and his grace. I'm gonna read one last thing. I'm not gonna tell you the whole backstory, but this is called Great Revivals in the Great Republic. I found it at Wayland Baptist University Library, tucked in the very back wall of the deepest part of the library. This guy named Warren Candler wrote this book in 1904. It says this, the revival of 1858 inaugurated, in some sense, the era of lay work in American Christianity. Wesley's system of class leaders, exhorters, and local preachers had done much at an earlier date in the same direction. But now the layman's day fully dawned on all the churches. No new doctrine was brought forward, but a new agency was brought to bear in spreading the old truth through the efforts of men who, if they could not interpret the scriptures with precision or train souls to perfection, could at least help inquiring sinners to find the Lord by relating how they themselves had found him. Since Christianity is a religion of experience, uh, experience this lay element was a power in the apostolic church of whom were St. Stephen and St. Luke. But it dropped out of the church when Christianity ceasing to be an experience was practiced only as a pompous system of priestcraft or taught as an abstruse philosophy of religion. It now returned in the regeneration of a nation. And again, Christian unity was again promoted as it had been by the Great Awakening, by the Wesleyan Revival, and by the Revival of 1800. When men come to know what are the essential truths of Christianity and to realize these truths in personal experience, strife about non-essentials perishes as if scorched by the breath of the Almighty. 
Revelation 12, 11 says they defeated him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb, Jesus first, and the word of their testimony or their story. Now, I think Cobus is in here somewhere. Cobus is my, my dude from South Africa. And he had to correct me because I didn't say the full verse. He goes, you're forgetting the second half. I was like, I am? He goes, man, you, you forgot the second half. You know what the second half is? And they didn't love their lives so much as to lose them. It's time to go. It's time to wake up a generation. We've said from the beginning, we want to have the third businessman's revival. The second one happened in 1857, and the first one happened when Jesus chose those 12 dudes. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for today. Man, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, you tell us that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Father, we just invite Holy Spirit into this place. Father, may, may flames come down. May fire ignite in the hearts and the souls of the men and the women who sit in this room. And may you have your way with us. Holy Spirit, come. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, come into this place. Come into this place and circumcise our hearts. Open up the walls and tear down the idols the idols of control and money, religion, politics, family, whatever we have ever placed above you, wherever we find peace, God, I pray that you would tear those down and that you would move in a mighty way in our lives. God, we love you, we praise you, and we pause this day and just ask you to fill us up with your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' powerful and mighty name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, come on. Let's hear it up for Keith. I told you it was going to be powerful, didn't I? We're going to take some time now to reflect on some questions, but just very quickly, I said to you, the biggest thing that I get asked when I tell people I moved to Abilene was what? Why? Well, I tell you, it was God's doing. There was no other... Have you been to Abilene, Texas? There is no other reason why I would be there. And it wasn't the food. I had five good nights of food. The Lord showed me in that week that I could eat comfortably, as you can tell. But after those five days, there was nothing else. I struggle. When I left Keith's house last night, after having some amazing food with people there... I drove to the hotel, which is just across the road, and I came up Milwaukee and 76. And when I talk about Lubbock being a mecca, I found a mecca of food. I mean, I could, I could spit and I would hit a pretty decent restaurant. Taco Villa, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A. They were all there. And I'm like, there's more in one block here than there's in the whole of Abilene, Texas. Buddy Holly was my association when I was 15 years old. Today, I told you, I've been in the theatrical, I'm in the theatrical production world. COVID killed us. I had 300 people working for me worldwide. On March the 20th, 2022, I had zero. Okay, I lost everything. And I lost it. When, I, when it shut down, I was in Abilene, Texas for a reason. Because the community of people showed me that God was going to make everything okay. I was going to survive because I didn't think I would. I've lost everything in my life. I've loved everything. I've gained everything. And I've poured everything into it. And they were right. I got invited. How I came to meet Keith, I got invited to what I was told was a book club. Come to this book club on a Sunday night, Matt meet some people. Well, they hoodwinked me. It wasn't a book club. It was life group. Yeah, to me, I was there crying. It's pretty normal for me. Talking about everything with this family, with Keith's brother. And they said to me, you're going to be okay. It is acceptable to pray 
for all the greatness that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to pour into you, Matt. Because I was speaking to Boniface just very quickly before we came on here, BB, and he said, our countries, Zambia and Britain, are quite closely connected. David Livingston, the great preacher, went and spread the word to Zambia and most of the world. And we were amazing at doing that. We'd done some pretty horrific things around the world, but we were great at spreading worship. And he said these words to me, right now we feel the worship needs to go home. And he's absolutely right. I couldn't stand and talk like this back in Britain today. And when Keith talks about you guys have relegated the word to Sundays, yes, you may feel like that. But I want you to know, you inspire me. If half of what you people here talk and do every week could be spread to other parts of this country and the world, we would live in a far better place. Because you talk about it so freely, so easy. It's like breathing to you guys. As long as you've got the substance to back it up and you believe in it, then you can make it great. He is making it great. You know, and so today, I was asked, I met Keith at a six-man football game. We laughed and joked. And a few weeks later, Brian says, can I give Keith your number? I said, of course you can. Keith rings me up and says, we're doing this 6-8 summit. It was supposed to be last year. Matt, can you come and MC for it? Now, if that's not the work of God, you know, I call myself the fake Christian. Because I'm still finding my way. I'm still trying to learn to hear and listen every word. Because I miss it. I miss it because it's shrouded in different idols, being a slave to my business. I have not been home in Abilene for four and a half months, traveling, trying to make my business work again. I'm home for five days. And what's happening during those five days? This event. It was meant to be. I was meant to be here. It was meant to happen today. And that is definitely God's doing. So I don't know the answer of why I've moved to Abilene. I, one day I hope I can stand on this stage and tell you all I've worked it out. But it is because of God. And today you're going to hear some prolific stories. And hopefully we will all go out of here today feeling ready. Ready to take the boom. Let's see what Keith's questions were. Are they there? So, thinking back to what Keith spoke about, what idols do you need to allow the Lord to tear down in your life? Every single one of us can relate to that. Have you ever considered an invitation back to the garden with God? And how does that change your relationship with the Lord moving forward? Take some time to reflect. The prayer room is at the back. And we'll be back with another incredible speaker really soon. Thank you.